Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Gordon Lindhurst. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to ensure that communities and town centres provide at least a basic level of banking access, in particular for older and disabled customers and small businesses. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the regulation of banking remains reserved to Westminster and the Scottish Government cannot compel banks to maintain a branch presence where they have taken a commercial decision to close. Uh, the Scottish Government appreciates that the banks must make savings and efficiencies in delivering services to customers in a modern and changing world, but clearly there is a continuing need or strong preference for face-to-face -face provision of banking for some. Digital access will not be available to or indeed suitable for everyone, and for the provision of key financial advice, many customers prefer direct contact. Uh, hence, while we recognise declining branch activity may be a driver for banks today, we would urge banks to see branch closures as a last resort, and before closing a branch, to consider consultation with local stakeholders and communities to explore all practical options. Gordon Lindhurst. I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. The Scottish Government report in 2013, Sustainable Responsible Banking, recognised the future importance of accessible community banking. It said the Scottish Government would, and I quote, explore the potential for promoting further community banking options in Scotland, end quote. The 2016 SNP manifesto also committed to encourage and support other providers of services in the banking se sector. Um, given these commitments, and also my understanding from the Minister's recent letter to me was that he remains committed to that, uh, and he mentioned in particular credit unions and post offices, will he and the Government commit to working with local community groups, such as in Juniper Green in Edinburgh, in order to explore options and viable alternatives for a continuation of banking services following the recent raft of branch closures? Minister. Well, um, I certainly uh, would accept that the, the recent uh, round of branch closures has been a great concern. I know uh, from representations that uh, Mr Lindhurst and indeed Mr Macdonald have made uh, in relation to Juniper Green and indeed previous closures in, in the area of Pentlands constituency and wider in Edinburgh, this is an issue that is causing great concern locally. Uh, as I indicated in my letter, we are very strongly supportive of the credit union movement and, uh, and it's quite right to point out that banks are not the only organisations able to provide local banking services. Uh, Scotland is currently well serviced uh, by, by uh, credit unions and there are 99 credit unions in Scotland as at the end of June uh, last year and the Scottish Government is working with the credit unions to grow the movement in Scotland so there may be opportunities in localities such as those affected by the recent uh, raft of branch closures to look at a credit union alternative. I would just say that at this moment in time uh, Scotland has proportionately a higher level of credit union membership than England and Wales so it's a well established movement here and according to the Bank of England's most recent quarterly statistics uh, that uh, there's approximately 7.2% 7 7 of the Scottish population are enrolled in a credit union compared with only 1.5% in England and 2.6% in Wales. So it is clearly an area where we could do more work, uh, but we're already starting from a good base of support for credit unions. Gordon MacDonald. By, by this summer, RBS will have reduced the number of branches available to my constituents from six to zero. The nearest branch will be at least two bus journeys away, and this will impact on the elderly and disabled and those constituents who prefer face-to-face -face banking. Would the minister agree that the very least large banks like RBS who completely withdraw from communities should extend their mobile branch network to provide a service to those who are unlikely or unable to take advantage of online banking? Minister. I will certainly agree with that sentiment that um, I think uh, where there is a reduction in coverage of bank, bank branches, clearly there is a, 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 an onus on the banks that have done that to try and make sure they maintain access to banking services as best they can. And mobile banks are very successful, uh, particularly in rural locations. There's no reason why that couldn't be rolled out in, in uh, suburban Scotland, indeed urban Scotland, where that's required. Uh, we do know that uh, RBS is, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, to, to know that RBS has delayed the closure uh, from three months to six months in terms of the process to give more time to assist customers to be able to be trained uh, to use digital training, uh, digital banking. Uh, but the, clearly, as I said in my initial answer to Mr Lindhurst, not for all, all customers will that be a relevant uh, means of accessing banking. So mobile banking may be a more acceptable option for many who prefer that face-to-face -face contact. 
And if members would make them brief, I'll take three other supplementaries on this. Kenneth Gibson first. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Clydesdale Bank's announced it will close 40 of its branches in Scotland, including two of the three in my constituency, Beath and Salcoats, cutting jobs and greatly inconveniencing customers. Can I ask what representations the Scottish Government is making to the Clydesdale Bank regarding these closures and whether the Minister shares my view that the Clydesdale Bank has not complied with the British Banking Association's access to banking protocol, which requires that a community engagement and an impact assessment is published prior to the closure? Minister. Well, on the latter point, I'm particularly interested in that. I will, I will look into whether, in this particular case, uh, that has been taken forward. Uh, I know there has been some concern expressed by members across the chamber around the degree to which consultations are actually meaningful. And hence, in my original answer, I was trying to stress that it's important that the banks actually consult genuinely with the community and the local uh, customers that are affected before taking such a step, and that it should be seen as a last resort. We do respect the commercial decisions when they have to be made. Clearly, in some cases, it will be necessary, given changes in, uh, in preferences of customers for using bank branches, but we do have an onus to try and protect those who are most vulnerable. In terms of engagement with the banks through, through, through the Financial Services Advisory Board, uh, the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and myself do engage regularly with the financial services industry and on a one-to-one -one basis I will, when I have opportunities to raise this with Clydesdale Bank and other banks, I will take that forward for the member and other members who have expressed concern. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And declaring an interest as the convener of the cross-party group in towns and town centres, can I say I am certain the Minister is aware of the rapid withdrawal of banks such as the Clydesdale from Troon in my constituency and Cumnock and Jean Freeman's constituency, as well as those already mentioned in Mr Gibson's constituency, thereby reducing their presence significantly in Ayrshire and elsewhere. Also be aware of the proposals to end coming from free banking, the free use of cash machines coming from the banking sector. And noting these two facts, what specific measures can the Scottish Government take to reduce the impact of this reduction in access to banking services, particularly for the elderly and our least well-off town centre users? Minister. Well, I certainly note the impacts in, in, in Mr Scott's constituency and in, in other parts of rural Scotland. I, I know they're particularly hard felt when there's the last branch in a town leaves and it can have a big impact both on the business community as well as uh, customers. So clearly it is important that we uh, try and think through how we can support that. We will obviously be listen uh, keenly to any suggestions as to government action that can help with this, but a point to the, the regulation industry is obviously still reserved. But we can, as I said in my response to Mr Lindhurst, look at alternative, service, alternative services where they may help particularly vulnerable groups uh, to access local banking, whether it's through a post office or indeed through uh, credit unions. And, and certainly given undertaking to Mr Scott, if there are options he is aware of that we could do something in, uh, in respect of his own constituency, I will listen to that. And Daniel Johnson. Uh, the, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister mentions post offices, uh, and indeed it's with deep worry the recent announcements of the closure of Crown post offices, including the Morningside post office in my constituency. Would you join me in condemning uh, this announcement by the post office and indeed the UK Government? Mm. Very briefly, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Clearly, we do share concerns about the contraction in the post office network, and we do make representations to, to UK ministers on that uh, issue. And I know my predecessor, Fergus Ewing, was very active in that as well. So it is an issue of concern, but we will look closely at whether we can do anything uh, to, to support communities that are affected. But clearly, uh, where credit unions, post offices are available, they are important alternatives to branches. And I would hope the post office uh, will take into account the wider impact of what they're doing on access to key services. Question number two, Donald Cameron. You ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to ensure that suitable vessels are deployed on the Malig to Armadale ferry route. Minister Hamza Yusuf. I am, of course, uh, aware of the views of communities served by this service. I can reassure them that Scottish ministers remain committed to the Malig Armadale service and to supporting its long term stability and growth. The Clyde and Hebrides ferry services are operated by Calmac uh, under contract with Scottish ministers. The oper operator charters the ferry fleet from uh, Seamount under the public service contract. CalMAC is, of course, responsible for the deployment of vessels to individual routes to best deliver the contracted services across the whole network. Uh, for summer 2017, CalMAC will run a two-vessel service in the route, uh, deploying the MV Loch Fine and the MV Lord of the Isles. Uh, CalMAC anticipate the vessel deployment on the Malay Armadale route this summer will offer additional capacity and sailings, as well as greater reliability. This should provide ferry users with an improved service uh, on the route this summer. Donald Cameron. I thank the Minister for his answer. As a result of this saga, both visitors and locals have faced massive disruption. Communities on both sides of the Sound of Slate have suffered. And while many of the issues lie with CalMAC in relation to vessels, as Minister responsible for both ferries and the islands, 
and as a member of a government who awarded the tender to CalMAC, will he take personal responsibility for pursuing an urgent solution to this problem? Minister. Can I say that uh, I fully accept, and I made this point last year and last summer to the communities in Slate and uh, Malaga and Armadale, that there was an unacceptable level of service and disruption that took place uh, last year. That's why I tasked uh, CMAL and CalMAC to come up with a, a, a better uh, and a more improved service. So they have done that with this uh, two-vessel solution, which will offer more sailings. It will offer an uh, increased number of return sailings per day and across the summer season. Uh, in addition, there will be uh, more cars that will be able to be taken uh, on the route as well. Uh, the lock fine will go through some modifications in order to make it uh, more suitable uh, for the route. As well as that, CalMAC have also offered support to the businesses in terms of marketing support, uh, promotional uh, support uh, as well. Uh, and CalMAC, importantly, have dedicated a point person who will lead uh, on engagement with the community for that route. Uh, now, of course, uh, because of the tidal nature of that route, there will be some element of disruption. But what is important is CalMAC can now have a much better idea of where that disruption might, or when that disruption might occur and put in place as many mitigating uh, measures as possible. So I'm confident that the summer timetable this year uh, should run uh, uh, better than, than it did, of course, last year. But yes, of course, I will keep uh, a close eye uh, on that. And uh, I would like to thank the, the members, uh, Kate Forbes and, and Ian Blackford in particular, who have been raising this issue with me consistently uh, since I came into post. Kate Forbes. Can the Minister advise what long-term decisions are being made to ensure we invest in our fleet of ferry vessels so that all coastal communities are served? Minister. I mean, Transport Scotland publishes an, an annual vessel replacement and, and deployment plan, uh, which looks at a programme of vessel retention, cascades, acquisitions and disposals. But to take, the, to take the general point that the member raises, I think it's a very, very important one. Uh, you know, is this government's successful introduction and rollout of RET, of course, that has brought more tourists, more people coming uh, onto these islands, which is a great success story, but also the limitations are there when we have a, a, a slightly ageing uh, fleet of, of vessels. But we are taking steps, of course, uh, to, to, to upgrade uh, that fleet. And we know we have two uh, hybrid vessels coming in, in 2018, which will be uh, of great uh, use uh, on the, on, across the network. But the member's point uh, generally uh, is one that I think is, is well made. Question number three, Neil Findlay. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government when it will introduce its Wild Fisheries Bill and what it will contain. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, draft provisions of a Wild Fisheries Bill were consulted on last year. We will shortly conclude our consideration of the results of that consultation. Uh, in doing so, we will in particular take account of the need to protect angling participation and access to angling. As stated in the 2016 programme for government, our intention is to introduce a bill during this parliamentary session. The next programme for government will set out further detail on the government's future legislative programme. Neil Findlay. Uh, will the Minister take the opportunity now to rule out completely changing the law, which would mean fishing for freshwater fish without a landowner's consent would go from being a civil case to a criminal case? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm not going to pre-announce details of the Bill's content ahead of the conclusion uh, of our consideration. I can advise the Member that discussions are current um, and active. Um, I have had some communication from other MSPs about a number of different issues which were part of the consultation. Um, but these were options uh, are not new. Um, they didn't signal government intent. There are indeed risks uh, to angling participation and access associated with some of them, uh, which will be key factors influencing any final decision I make. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister what progress has been made to review the inadequate compensation packages currently offered to businesses carrying out traditional fishing methods such as half poke and stake netting on the Solby Firth? Cabinet Secretary. Well, th these conversations, as the Member uh, is aware, are ongoing. We are looking at the issues uh, in connection with half netting, for example, uh, which is uh, part of a project. Uh, ongoing. Um, it started in June last year and a licence application is being prepared to continue the science work in 2017. Um, these are all ongoing discussions um, and I'm very happy to have a separate conversation with the member if he wishes to come and see me. I think that would be again um, uh, about this um, and any other matters related to wild fisheries. Question number four, Gillian Martin. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its Learning Directorate assists young carers in accessing their right to education. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, today is Young Carers Awareness Day, in which we are all invited to recognise the unique challenges that young carers in Scotland face. I am happy to do so and to acknowledge that when this Government states it is determined to ensure that all of our children and young people get the same chances and choices to succeed at school and in life, that includes young carers as well. The work that is underway across my portfolio, from the transformation of early learning and childcare entitlement to 1140 hours by 2020, the funding and activity to close the attainment gap, the plan to deliver excellence and equity in school education and activity to take forward measures to widen access, review student support and reform the learner journey will <coughs> consider the needs of young carers to determine what more might need to be done to enable them to fulfil their potential. Julian Martin. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that solutions lie in a cross-government portfolio approach and cannot be looked at purely in an educational context and are wider than a Scottish Government responsibility? I, I, I accept that point and it is important that we coordinate and link up at all levels of government, not just within the Scottish Government, but also in local authorities and communities whereby we focus on the needs of individual young people and ensure that those needs are met. And uh, there are many good examples in the public services of where that thinking is brought to the fore. Um, it delivers much better outcomes and opportunities for young people and it makes sure that they achieve the support that, to which they are entitled and the Government is committed to working in such a fashion. Question number five, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that both parents can play an active role in their children's lives following divorce or separation. Minister Mark Macdonald. Uh, Scottish Government recognises the importance of relationship support given the impact that divorce and separation can have on children. Uh, that is why we are providing around £2 million per year through our Children, Young People and Families Early Intervention Fund to organisations which provide relationship support, including Relationship Scotland and The Spark. Uh, we have also funded Relationship Scotland to develop a new Parenting Apart service with the specific aim of helping separating or separated parents to support their children through what can be a difficult time. And we continue to support Parentline Scotland, which provides provides advice and information to parents and families on a range of issues, including issues relating to the breakup of relationships. Ivan McKee. I uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, family breakdown can be a difficult time for all concerned, particularly the children. Recent research from Sweden, where shared parenting following family breakdown is now the norm, and where gender stereotypes regarding childcare responsibilities are becoming a thing of the past, has shown that when children spend significant amounts of time with both parents, social, psychological and emotional outcomes are improved. Can the, can the Minister undertake to look into this research and to evaluate how it might inform the approach to family law and contact arrangements in Scotland? Minister. I'm happy to assure Mr McKee that we are aware of this research and it forms part of a wide body of international research and evidence which helps to inform our own approach in developing policy. Uh, Mr McKee may also wish to know that we are already acting in this area to update and publish information to support separating parents. Uh, we're also committed to reviewing the legislation, the Children in Scotland Act 1995. Uh, the intent behind our manifesto commitment in this area is to consider how to ensure uh, the child remains at the centre of responsibilities and rights related to parenting. In addition, we wish to ensure the legislation enables children to maintain relationships with significant adults in their lives when in the child's best interests, even if their parents' relationships break down. Uh, we also need to protect children from inappropriate continuing contact. Question number six, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government to give an update on the rollout of fibre optic cables across Rutherglen constituency. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government's investment through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has delivered fibre connections to more than 6,100 homes and businesses in the Rutherglen constituency, with more than 99% of those connected able to achieve superfast speeds. Clear hockey. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, it has been brought to my attention that some new housing developments in my constituency of Rutherglen have been built with only partial access to fibre optic internet connectivity being made available at the time homes are constructed. I understand the UK Government has struck a deal to avoid this situation going forward. What assurances uh, can the Scottish government, uh, has the Scottish Government received from the UK Government that this will apply to housing developments such as those in Rutherglen? Camera Secretary. 
Uh, well, what we have done in the Scottish Government is discuss the issue with BT Open Reach, uh, presenting officer, whom we now understand offered to provide fibre to the uh, premises connectivity to housing developments of 30 properties or more and have a tariff proposal for smaller developments. Uh, I intend to have further discussions with BT about this. From the first of this month, uh, amendments to build the building regulations set out a standard for in-building physical infrastructure for high-speed electronic communications networks. Now, that's rather a mouthful, but what it means, presiding officer, is that this enables easier installation of fibre at any time to existing buildings. So the Scottish Government has acted in both of the respects for the important matter that Clare Hockey has raised.